Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, what I'd like to do today is I had a comment on one of my videos to take a look at Velid. And so I didn't answer, but I wanted to see it first and kind of look at it a little bit, kind of see if it's something that I think is kind of interesting. So the creators of Velid, that is the cult of the dead cow, created a replacement for both Tor and IPFS. That's the interplanetary file system. And Tor, of course, is the onion router. So let's, let's let them describe what it was that they were trying to do. So let's take a look at the announcement that happened three weeks ago at Black Hat in Las Vegas. The Valid mission, we exist to develop, distribute, and maintain a privacy-focused communication platform and protocol for the purposes of defending human and civil rights. So there's a big mission there. We spent a lot of time thinking about this thing before we started writing code on it. We want to affect a particular outcome on the world. We're not interested in just writing cool code for the sake of it. You know, we want to rethink the way applications are built so that the things people take for granted about application development change. You don't have to monetize everything. You don't have to sell users out just to make your cloud bill get paid. That kind of future is the future we should have had. So let's get into a little bit. It is really meant to fill a gap uh, for Tor and IPFS. So what's the problem with Tor? Well, you know, Tor has been around a while. It, it is a very, I mean, it does have privacy in mind and it does use, it does provide some anonymity as well. But there are some problems with Tor. There's a problem with anything that's, uh, that's uh, software developed by people. So I don't know if AI will do any better, <laughs> but probably not. But uh, uh, Tor, of course, is privacy oriented but it does have several problems. Surprise, surprise. First of all, it is, it is capped at a relatively slow bandwidth uh, for the network. And there's a reason behind that, which had to do with at the time Tor was introduced, that they didn't want to be taking up all of the uh, bandwidth on, on the machines that people provided as either guard nodes, entrance nodes, or exit nodes, uh, because those are all volunteers that do that. Also, the other problem with Tor is when you make your first connection, you don't get a choice as to what nodes you connect through. Tor connect, the onion does all of that for you. And so you, those, um, typically stay up for the length of your session. Although like, you know, there's buttons in the Tor browser that you can, you can clean sweep the connection and ask for a whole new set. But again, you don't get any choice as to what entrance and exit nodes you're using. So, uh, and so those routes are persistent until you end your session. Also, one of the other concerns is there, I don't know if it's been confirmed or if it's just fear that the NSA has servers on both the entrance and the exit nodes. And I think uh, I saw a number, and I don't know where that came from, of 100. What about ISPF? What are some of the problems with it? I mean, it it's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, it's been around for, what, since 2015 or so. The problem with ISPF is, is it uses a slow gateway. Also, web browsers uh, seem to have, at least this is my observation, uh, seem to have a hard time connecting to the ISPF uh, protocol or the links uh, that are provided. So I have noticed that they time out quite often or just, they just struggle to make that connection. Also, your private data if you're trying to store private data in ISPF, there's a couple of issues. First of all, the hosting systems are really not willing to host your data free of charge for any length of time. 
what if we took the best of Tor and the best of ISPF and we combined them and we created something new? Well, that's what the creators of uh, Velid wanted to do. So what is Velid? What is it? Uh, Velid is an open source, peer-to-peer, mobile-first, uh, networked application framework. It's not an application into itself. That is, it's not like you go download the Tor browser, you start working on the, the Onion router, and you're up and going. If I remember correctly, Tor started out very similarly. And that's kind of where Valid is today, is I think they've invested 100,000 lines of code Valid is an application framework which enables the development of fully distributed applications without blockchain. So there's no blockchain in here or a transactional layer at their base. And they go further in that they try to minimize the servers. And one of the comments that Christian made at the beginning was of his talk was, you know, why should you make Bezos rich off of storing your data that he in turn then uh, he'll do analysis on it, and then they'll sell it to ad, ad agencies. So you get sold that way, and that is the cloud. Cloud is to make money off of you. But what if you took that away? What if you took the cloud server away from them? We all participated in becoming the cloud. That's exactly what Bella it is. It's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, system where there is no cloud, uh, or I should say spoon. There is no spoon. So let's talk about the encryption portions of Valid for a minute. There's a version that covers the encryption layers, and this is it's called VLD0 right now. That provides strong, appropriate cryptographic choices that are essential to the functioning of Valid. Valid provides application guarantees about how data is handled on the wire and when it's being kept at rest in storage. Cryptographic systems were chosen for Valid that work well together and provide a balance of speed and encrypted, uh, excuse me, and cryptographic hardness. So what are the kinds that they have? So let's start down the list. The first is authentication. So for authentication, they use ED25519. That, of course, is elliptic curve 25519. That was chosen to provide the public and private key authentication as well as the signing capabilities that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. The, the next one is the key exchange. That is X25519. That's curve 25519. That has your Duffy-Hellman uh, functions that allow nodes to generate a symmetric key to communicate privately. Also, uh, encryption is provided by an extended version of ChaCha20 called Poly1305. Uh, ChaCha20 is a 192-bit extended nonce uh, that is both fast uh, authenticated stream cipher and it, with its associated data, or AEAD. Uh, the message digest is Blake 3. Blake 3 is extremely fast as a cryptographic hash that is highly parallelizable and is strong as SHA-3, 256, except it's over 17 times faster than SHA-3, 256. So key derivation is argon 2 that's the password hash generator, which should be slow and resistant to GPU attacks. Argon2 was the winner of the 2015 password hashing competition. So it's a very good standard for that, as far as I know. What about upgrading everything? Let's talk about cryptographic uh, first. As I mentioned, there is a layer here called VLD0. If they were to uh, upgrade their encryption standards for uh, uh, Valid, uh, they would bump that number from VLD0 to 1. So because cryptographic is no exception, and uh, as computing power improves, cryptographic attacks evolve. There's weaknesses that are found in cryptographic systems. Those are all inevitable. 
the secure storage. We've mentioned that a couple of times so far. What is that for? Well, there's a number of pieces in the uh, secured storage depending upon what function it's providing. So, for example, protected stores are your device level secret storage. Those would be used for your Mac OS and iOS keychains. Also, Android keychain, Windows and its protected storage. There's also Linux and its secret service. They've also added a new one using a Rust crate, which is a key ring manager that allows you to manage those uh, key stores there as well. There's also uh, an encrypted table store where the APIs are, are being exposed to applications to make safe, safe storage of data easy. So all devices are welcome and they're all treated fairly and equally. So there isn't a server uh, per se and there isn't a client per se. There are just users on the network communicating through the channel and, and allowing you to access applications like Discourse or Signals or whatever that might be, for example. You have the choice between using the public valid network or you can build your own. So if you want to invite people to your private network, you can do that. Uh, you don't have to be out in the Wild West if you're just trying to converse or move data between one or more people. So the nodes help each other. There's mutual aid for connectivity uh, so that you can reach the point you want. Let's talk a little bit about routing and how that works. So if you're familiar with Tor, Tor has um, guard uh, nodes, they have entrance nodes, and, and then they have exit nodes. There's also nodes that are routing nodes inside of the Tor network. So valid routes are made up of a combination from, uh, unlike Tor, Tor chooses its pathways for you. You don't get a choice. Uh, I think the only choice you get is if you're going to use a proxy or not. But valid, uh, valid routes are a combination of the source and the de destination private routing. Because no node can trust any other node to pick the whole route, both the source and the destination have to participate and collaborate. So what does that mean? So as you'll see here on, on the, the diagram, there is a node A and a node B that are across from each other. So the, the, the transmission path is going from A to B to start going across the top. And it enters the first two nodes, which are the safety route. Those are chosen by A. Private routes are chosen by B. Once these two are snapped together, in the, when the communication is set up and the channels are established between these end-to-end -end points, those two, the safety route and the private route, snap together to form the, the route for sending data to the node B from A. Then node B will construct the compiled route that is used to get the information back to node A. And it this works a lot like uh, Tor. So we have these security envelopes that are being used. And so when B transmits its uh, data, its data to the first node, it contains encryption pathways for uh, N5 to 6, N6 to N7, N7 to N8, and then finally N8 to A. And so each one of those layers is when, it, when B transmits to N5, N5 peels off its encryption layer and then looks up where it's got to send next to get it to N6. Sends the packet to N6, N6 peels off its encryption layer, and as you can see, the, the message starts to shrink as it moves through the compiled uh, route. So when it reaches the last one, N8, N8 pulls off its encryption and all it's left is the address for A. And so it, it sends that encrypted packet to A and then A 
decrypts the message that it received done. In summary, the valid is offering us an IP privacy that means our location is also safe from being viewed. Users don't have to do anything to use it because it's made a part of the application. So there's no IP address and that means there's no way to track, no way to collect, and no way to correlate uh, where the packets came from. One thing I forgot to mention was it, you can't just take over a node and see all the traffic that you need. I mean, looking left and right. Because the way Valid works, in order for you to understand what was going on, because you don't know, I mean, from one message to another, the route could change. So it's not like Tor at all. Uh, and so in order for an eavesdropper to be able to get a hold of your messages and track them back, they would have to see all of Valid and track everything. So if you want to participate, they have the need, obviously they have need for developers and testers and just regular folks that want to just put it up and try it and keep running it for a while. Uh, maybe help with application development so if, or documentation if you're interested. They were mentioning that on the, on the video they did for that. They, they had a few things they needed to do, but they had documentation they had to complete first. So uh, you can find them on the web. I'll, pro I'll provide you the links below. They have a Twitter account that if you want to talk to them directly, you can. There's also a Mastodon link. There's one for Discord. And, of course, they are hosting their code on GitLab, which probably a smart idea <laughs> given, given what they're trying to do. I mean, it's too early to really review this because it, there isn't the same kind of infrastructure that's in place like there is with Tor. Uh, I imagine that will get corrected pretty quickly here where we'll probably start seeing plugins for browsers that allow us to start using this. And then finally, maybe we'll start seeing browsers that actually contain the protocol layers within it. But uh, we're just going to have to wait until all of those things happen. And, and that and how long that takes is up to us, right? How many of us are willing to go help and get the work done? Because if there's only one person doing it, it's going to take a long time. But if there's 20 or 100 of us, yeah, maybe it'll get done a whole lot faster. That's all I had for now. Uh, I'll be back, I'm sure, and we'll talk more about this in the future as both I learn more and more work gets done and more features come online. But yeah, they definitely need our help. Hope to see you all again soon. Thank you to my Patreons and my channel members. Thank you so much. I sure appreciate for you taking care of the channel so that we can do new things. And hope to see you in the next video, and bye for now.